Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are very excited and happy to have you join our fifth Morocco webinar of this 2023 EI webinar series. Let's give a brief intro about Morocco EI and who we are. Morocco EI is an initiative led by EI experts in Morocco and abroad to promote EI growth in Morocco and build a strong collaborative EI community, both locally and abroad. We have launched many uh, activities and initiatives and also organized many uh, events, uh, such as uh, the conferences. And for today's uh, webinar, we are organizing many uh, AI webinar series that aims to bring Moroccan AI researchers to present and share their work with the community. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, and join us on Slack to be notified about our upcoming webinars and other activities. Our guest speaker for today's webinar is Kenza Tezi. She will be presenting narrowing precipitation uncertainty over high mountain Asia with probabilistic machine learning, where she will be detailing how to enhance the precision of precipitation estimates through the use of probabilistic machine learning with the combination of multiple precipitation sources. Inza is a third year PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge and a member of the EI for Environmental Risk Program. Her PhD focuses on applying Gaussian process-based methods to better understand precipitation in high mountain Asia. She has extensive experience in applying machine learning to various environmental problems, including wildfires, wildfires, glacier elevation change, and cloud identification. Prior to joining Cambridge, she completed a master's degree in physics at Imperial College London and represented Morocco at the 2014 Winter Olympics in Alpine Skiing. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them on the chat on Zoom or YouTube, and we'll make sure to bring them up at the end of the presentation. And please be sure to stick around for our networking session at the end of the presentation, where we'll be breaking out in smaller groups, and you will get the chance to meet and talk with some of the attendees. The presentation will last for approximately 30 minutes, followed by 10 minutes q and day. And without further ado, Kinza, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Iman. I'll just get on my screen. There we go. Can you all see this? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Good evening, everyone. As Ima mentioned, my name is Kenza, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. I would like to talk to you um, this evening about how we can use probabilistic machine learning to improve precipitation estimates over high mountain Asia. So first, um, I'll discuss why high mountain Asia is so important and why modeling precipitation in this area is so challenging. Then we'll learn about why probabilistic machine learning is an attractive solution to overcome these challenges and introduce the model that I'm using. We'll then look at the performance of the model with a couple of validation experiments before looking at the results of the model when applied to the whole study area. Finally, we'll discuss the limitations of this project and ideas for future work. So why High Mountain Asia? High Mountain Asia is the high altitude area of the Asian continent that includes the Hindu Kush mountains over here, the Himalayas and the Tibetan plateau. Most of Asia's great rivers such as the Indus, the Ganges and the Mekong originate from these mountains. Together, they work as a water tower, storing snow and ice in the winter, which melts in the spring and summer. Through this mechanism, High Mountain Asia supports the livelihood of over 1.9 billion people, providing fresh water for domestic use, agriculture, and energy through hydropower plants. However, this region is also one of the most sensitive to climate change. As temperatures rise, river flow is rapidly, rapidly shifting from being driven by glaciers and snowmelt to exclusively rainfall. These changes are expected to lead to more extreme variations in river flow rate, and in turn, more floods, landslides, and droughts. These changes, coupled with an increasing demand for water, make future water availability in this area uncertain. And the largest source of uncertainty to our 
understanding of current and future water security is precipitation. It may be hard to picture what I mean when I talk about water security risk, but climate change is already happening now, and we don't have to look very far to get a flavor of what's to come. So one such event uh, were the floods in Pakistan last year. The country received an unprecedented amount of rain that led to one of the worst environmental crises the world has seen. According to the UN, over 33 million people were displaced by the flooding. So imagine if the whole population of Morocco had to leave their homes because of a natural disaster. More than 1,700 people lost their lives and more than 2.2 million people, or sorry, people's uh, houses were damaged or destroyed. The floods also damaged most of the water systems in the affected areas. And that forced more than 5 million people to rely solely on contaminated water from ponds and wells. And it's also important to remember that in this climate crisis and in future climate related crises, not everyone will be affected equally. Children will suffer more than adults, women will suffer more than men, and those in the poorest communities will bear the biggest burden of these events. So despite these very real risks, um, precipitation in high mountain Asia is still poorly understood. And this can explain, be explained for three reasons. Firstly, the complex topography of high mountain Asia makes the distribution of precipitation highly heterogeneous with large variability in precipitation over very small areas. Secondly, there are very little direct measurements of precipitation, especially in altitudes above 2000 meters. Indirect measurements through satellite observations exist, but their coarse resolution is unable to capture the distribution between mountain valleys and mountain ridges. And they also struggle to capture extreme events due to the orbits of the satellites that make these measurements and to identify precipitation over glaciers. The third challenge to modeling precipitation in this area is that climate models uh, really struggle and have many limitations for over high mountain Asia. Not only are they very computationally expensive to run as within uh, any location, but they're also extremely inaccurate because they're not uh, parameterized for the dominant physical processes that happen over mountainous regions. So coming from that, my PhD research centers around one question. How can we improve these estimates, these precipitation estimates for scientists and policymakers? In order to do this, we need to make sure, first and foremost, that the precipitation predictions are accurate. We should be able to make these predictions from a small amount of data that suffers from missing values. We should also be able to make predictions using both gridded and non-gridded information, such as point measurements from weather stations. We also want to make predictions at new arbitrary locations, not necessarily where the model has already been trained. And finally, and most importantly, the predictions should have an uncertainty. By this, I mean each prediction should include a probability of how likely uh, any given precipitation value is. And this can help us understand the likelihood of extreme events, such as droughts or floods. We can achieve all five of these conditions using a probabilistic machine learning method called multi-fidelity Gaussian processes. So how does it work? Uh, let's first start with the concept of probabilistic machine learning. Rather than outputting a single value, such as the one we have here, a probabilistic machine learning method will output a probability distribution. For each value of y, there is an associated probability. A common probabilistic machine learning method is a Gaussian process. Uh, let's consider the following regression problem where we have a set of observations, xi and yi, y being the precipitation value we want to model. And these observations are generated by a function f and then modulated by a noise term epsilon i, which we're going to assume is normally, distribution, normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation sigma. Uh, the function f can be modeled with a Gaussian process, 
Uh, so very formally, a DP or uh, yes, Gaussian process can be uh, defined as a stochastic process where any finite collection of its random variables, so the x's, is distributed according, sorry, y's, is distributed according to a multivariate normal distribution. And just like a multivariate normal distribution, a Gaussian process is defined by a mean function mu and a covariance kernel um, or covariate kernel function k. So here the x's again represent the inputs. X prime um, represents an arbitrary location uh, somewhere else um, to model the covariance. And the thetas represent the hyperparameters of the covariance function and the mean function. So these hyperparameters, they can be set manually or they can be optimized through maximum likelihood estimation. Because we're working with probabilities, we can fit the model uh, to the data through Bayes' theorem. We start by setting a distribution of what we think the model output should look like before we get the data. This is what's called the prior or the prior distribution. We can then update the model with the probability of the data um, and the probability of the model given that data. And then our distribution gets updated. And this final distribution is called the posterior or the posterior distribution. Gaussian processes are usually represented in a plot like this one. So here we can see some observations that are shown by the blue dots. And from these observations, the Gaussian process generates its posterior distribution. The posterior here is represented by its 95% confidence interval, which is shown here in the shaded blue region. What we can see is that the posterior is very small and constrained around the data points. But as you move further away, um, the uncertainty gets larger. The black line represents the mean of the posterior distribution. And the, you, the model can also generate samples by connecting uh, possible outputs for each of the x's. GPs have many advantages as a machine learning model. They provide, as you've just seen and I've explained, well calibrated and principled uncertainty estimates. So assuming that the model is well specified, a Gaussian process knows when it doesn't know. And yeah, as you've just seen, it increases the uncertainty away from the training distribution. These uncertainties are also useful for determining the likelihood of extreme events and improving decision making. Gaussian processes are also useful for machine learning with highly correlated data sets. In many applications, including geospatial sciences, observations are not going to be independently or identically distributed, but closely correlated to one another. Gaussian processes also provide interpretable machine learning. The GP covariance function and mean function hyperparameters specify explainable and high-level properties generated by the functions. Uh, this is in complete opposition to neural network weights, for example, that cannot obviously be linked to any physical properties of the data set. We can also do data efficient machine learning. Because a GP is non-parametric and a Bayesian method, we can work with a very limited amount of data while still retaining a lot of model expressivity and avoiding overfitting. Finally, we can use uh, GPs in machine learning systems. Because GP regression and classification is quite unlikely to fail, it can be reused reliably as a subpart of a bigger machine learning system. So for example, Gaussian processes have been used to good effect in probabilistic numerics, reinforcement learning, and things such as automated statisticians. So in um, my study case, I would like to use Gaussian processes as the building blocks to a model that can combine data sets of different fidelities. We can think of the fidelity of a data set as being defined as a combination of the data's precision and accuracy. The most accurate set of observations with the highest resolution are referred to as high fidelity data and less, accurate, less accurate and coarse observations or for example, model simulations are denoted as low fidelity data. So in many cases, um, high fidelity observations can be expensive to produce or uh, measure, whereas low fidelity observations are usually more accessible and therefore more numerous. 
a multi-fidelity model combines these low fidelity data sets with more accurate ones, um, but which have limited observations in order to predict the high fidelity output more effectively. So let's define our problem again, our regression problem again with the fidelity levels. So consider S fidelity levels producing outputs uh, YT allocations XT, where T is any uh, is a number from one to S. So in this case, YS would denote the output of the most accurate and expensive function to evaluate, whereas Y1 is the output of the cheapest and least accurate function. The observation Y at level T can be generated by a function FT, and this represents our multi-fidelity Gaussian process. So FT is a sum of two terms, a function FT minus one, uh, which is a model that was fit on the data from the previous fidelity level, and a function F error, which models the bias between the two fidelity levels. Both FT and F error are Gaussian processes, and because of the additive properties of Gaussian processes, and in general of uh, any multivariate normal distribution, the sum between uh, or of two GPs is also a Gaussian process. And so this equation can actually still be solved analytically and be jointly optimized. And we'll see why that's important uh, at the end. And yes, the rho t, that's a scaling factor and has a scalar value. So this particular uh, recursive form of Gaussian processes was first presented by Le Cartier and Garnier in 2014. And I've included a reference to this um, original paper at the end of my slides. So let's look at this process visually. Um, in step zero, we have our two data sets. In gray, our low fidelity data points that are generated by the function shown in the gray dashed line. And then in blue, we have our high fidelity data points, which are less numerous, also have a higher resolution that they can be closer together than the gray ones. And that's generated by the blue dashed line, um, which is what we're going to say is the true underlying function we want to model. We first in, fit a DP in step one to the data set. Um, this we'll call F1. And this gives us, um, just as we saw earlier, nice uncertainty estimates with larger uncertainties at locations that are further away from the training distribution. In step two, we sample F1 at the locations of the high fidelity data. And we're not only taking the mean, but also the variance or standard deviation. Finally, in step three, we use these values and observations from the high fidelity data to fit our second uh, Gaussian process. And this gives us a very satisfying fit. We recover the true function almost perfectly. But this, of course, is just a simple toy model. Real data is much more complicated. Speaking of complicated, let's come back to the mountains and look at a case study for the BS and such as river basins, which are two major tributaries of the Indus River. Geographically, this is an area at the borders of Pakistan and India. So what I'm showing with this map is a network of 58 rain and snow gauges, which have been active for at least five years between 1980 and 2013. We would like to use a multi-fidelity GP to combine model data with that of the gauges, i.e. we want to learn the mapping between inaccurate but complete model data and that of sparse but accurate gauge data in order to make predictions in this area over here that has no gauges. This is a hard problem. We're trying to make out of distribution predictions with respect to not only location, but also elevation. Because as you can see, um, most of the observations or stations will lie in this low altitude area, whereas we're trying to predict in this high altitude location over here. So before we go off and make predictions, we first need to understand how well our method works. And to do this, we set up some validation experiments where we study monthly precipitation between 2000 and 2005. I'm going to explain two of them here. So first, we apply our model over Europe, which is a well-studied uh, region before looking at our case study area. In both cases, we use a multi-fidelity Gaussian process with two levels of fidelity. Our low fidelity set in both cases is going to be ERA-5 climate reanalysis data. 
So uh, climate reanalysis is basically a numerical weather model that's run in the past and constrained with historical observations of the climate. The data is gridded uh, on approximately a 31 by 31 kilometer grid. For Europe, we're going to be using um, as the high fidelity data set um, value 86, which is a data set that contains 86 weather stations, but these are very representative of different climates that are found across the European continent. And for the BS and Sutledge, we use the gauges I showed earlier for the high fidelity uh, data set. So we want to know how well the model does when we ask it to make predictions at new locations that are far away from the training set. So to do this, we're going to use a K-fold cross-validation scheme to evaluate our model. This means we're going to split up the stations into different groups, train the model on all the groups except one, and then check to see how well the model performed on the excluded data. This process is then repeated for each of the group permutations. So these plots show our cross-validation groups or folds as anyone for both of our validation experiments. And as inputs here, we're going to be using time, latitude, longitude, and elevation. A good way of evaluating our model is going to be through a metric called the coefficient of determination or R squared. And this represents the amount of variance in the data that's being explained by our model. With one being a complete match, zero being the equivalent of drawing a straight line through the data's mean, and any negative value being worse than that. So we can plot the R squared of the era five fit with a simple Gaussian process as a function of the R squared fit um, for the multi-fidelity GP output. And what we find is that over Europe, we can see that in most cases, there is a uh, improvement over, a significant improvement over uh, just fitting the model or using a model with just the low fidelity data or error five. So the dots are all or mostly above the dashed line. And the ones that are not, these green ones actually correspond to the group that was over the Pyrenees. And that one's especially hard because it combines both uh, coastal and mountainous climates. The results are a little more mixed in the case of the BS and Sutledge Basin, but we still get an overall improvement over era five. And we're, we're actually quite interested in saving some very bad cases. So these red dots here and the, the purple one as well. And the, the red dots actually correspond to our high fidelity, oh sorry, our high altitude group within the basin. So it's pretty optimistic going forward. We can also, um, or rather we also improve on other Gaussian process benchmarks where we use only the high fidelity data. And we also tested the state or tested the state of the art model uh, for downscaling that has a similar or smaller number of benefits to multi-fidelity Gaussian processes. And we found that these, um, because of so the, the size of this data set, because it's so small, we're actually not converging on any sensible results. So now that we know that the model works, we can go and apply it to the whole basin. Here are some results showing the annual and seasonal averages between 2000 and 2010. The top row here represents the era five uh, data set, so the low fidelity one, and the bottom row rep represents the output of the multi-fidelity Gaussian processes. Um, the darker colors represent lower precipitation values and the, I'm sorry, the lighter colors represent the higher ones. So the multi-fidelity GPP output, we're predicting at a line kilometer resolution. Um, and this is pretty arbitrary. You can choose any resolution you want, but this, this resolution was specifically chosen because it allows for municipal level decision-making. So this could allow um, towns and cities to um, make informed choices on where to place dams, for example, or flood defenses. We also, of course, have the corresponding uncertainty maps 
uh, for these predictions. In the top row, we have the plot of the 95% confidence interval for the model. Again, the lighter colors represent the higher values and the darker colors, the lower confidence intervals, or rather more constrained ones. And what we can see quite interesting is that, interestingly, is that the highest uncertainties are not actually concentrated where the model has uh, no precipitation measurements, but rather in this central area here. We can also try to understand uh, the model's relative uncertainty by highlighting where the model has relatively high uncertainty values compared to the mean posterior value. And this is what we're doing in the second row. We basically divided the data up into different quantiles for the posterior mean and a different quantiles for the uncertainty. And so areas that are shaded in very light blue represent uh, locations that have been given very low precipitation estimates, but high uncertainties, whereas the areas that are shown in pink have the highest precipitation rates, but the pretty low or very constrained uncertainty bounds. And this makes sense, right? Because this is the area, or these are the areas where we have the highest density of precipitation measurements or high fidelity precipitation measurements. So we can also compare the model to the environmental gold standard. Uh, the gold standard is called Aphrodite and is a product that's generated by interpolating gauge data with a custom made lookup table. On the left, I show the difference between Aphrodite and our model. On average, uh, our model and Aphrodite generally agree with each other with our model predicting slightly more precipitation and extreme values. Uh, and this actually corresponds really well with the literature when we compare Aphrodite to gauge measurements. The Aphrodite tends to underestimate the extremes and is, has a slight, slight dry bias. However, when we start looking at the monsoon season, we start to see very significant spatial differences. And I'm still trying to analyze where these differences are coming from. So earlier we talked about resolution but actually what we care about is not just the resolution, it's the effective resolution of our model. Is the model generating a structure at finer scales or is it just outputting noise? We can evaluate this by plotting the power density spectrum of the data, which tells us how much structure is being generated at each of the resolutions. So here we have um, structure or yeah, the power variable and on the x-axis is the resolution. And what we can see is that the highest resolutions um, are models producing five times more structure than ERA-5 or Aphrodite. There are, of course, many ways that we could build on this work. So in the next section, I'm going to talk about the most interesting ones. One of the obvious limitations of the framework that we're using here is that we're using a linear combination of Gaussian processes. That means if there are nonlinear relationships in the data, they won't be able to capture um, these. This has been addressed uh, by another paper from Perdicaris and Al in 2016. And they set up a similar autoregressive framework using deep Gaussian processes. So a deep DP is just when you use the output of one Gaussian process as the input to the next. However, the fact that the DPs are being fit recursively in this way uh, at each layer rather than jointly means that it's very easy for the GPs to overfit. And this is actually what I found when I applied this model to the data set. To alleviate this problem, we could implement a model called a multi-fidelity deep Gaussian process, which pre was presented by Cutter and Al in 2018, 2019. And this model um, basically uses information from all the previous layers um, when uh, making inference on the final one. And this means that it's much more robust to uh, overfitting, but this setup actually requires a lot of variational approximations, including inducing points. So it would be much more involved, more involved to set up, but it could be an interesting path for future work. The second issue or limitation or opportunity for um, further research is the scalability of the model. So Gaussian processes, they have one major drawback is that they're extremely computationally complex. They scale um, 
with n to the power of three, so n being the number of data points, and um, just the memory to basically save uh, the covariance function or kernel function, uh, or rather kernel matrix, scales with n to the power of two. This means it would be hard to scale up the model to larger areas or time periods. Uh, it also would be nice if we could use the model on a daily frequency rather than monthly, like we're looking at here. Um, fortunately, there are a few approximations we can make that would be particularly suited to gridded data, such as structured kernel interpolation. So that's another area of research that's possible. So although we, we've shown that it's possible to get improvements by combining these different data sets, I think this work has actually highlighted that still more data is needed to make better decisions, regardless of our model choice. However, because we have uncertainty estimates from the multi-fidelity Gaussian process, we can use these to inform the placement of future sensors through something such as multi-objective Bayesian optimization. And this comes from the fact that the GP with the GP, you can easily update the model with new data through online learning. That means we can incorporate new um, data into the model without having to retrain the hyperparameters or re-optimize the hyperparameters, which would be equivalent to retraining the model for a neural network. So we can basically place uh, data at hypothetical new locations and see which locations minimize the global uncertainty that we have for precipitation in the basin. So we've seen it's possible to use multi-fidelity Gaussian processes to combine sparse precipitation gauge data with that of less accurate climate model or reanalysis data. We are creating a product that better captures structure and extremes that can predict the arbitrary locations, and overcomes grading bias. It also works with sparse data sets. And most importantly, it can give us principled uncertainty estimates. I'll be releasing a full 30 year data set uh, for this area soon, taking a small step towards helping the most vulnerable communities adapt to humanity's greatest challenge. Um, so thank you for listening and I'm very happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, Kinza, for the great presentation. And uh, we'll leave the floor for Duan to ask the questions as he is our climate change expert. Yeah, thank you very much, Iman. And thanks again, uh, Kenza, for, for this really instructive um, presentation. So uh, yeah, we did receive uh, so many questions. Some of them are, um, are basic questions, basic machine learning questions. Some of them are really focused on the Gaussian processes. So I will try to mix Okay, so mm -hmm. let, let me start with this very first question. So um, this is probably an easy one. How you how you work is related to Kriegin? Uh, are these the same methods? Uh, yes, they're extremely similar. I would say that the main difference is that you're optimizing hyperparameters and specifying a covariance kernel. Uh, really, that's the main difference is that the fact that you're doing the optimization and you're injecting a lot more of your prior beliefs or you're able to inject a lot more of your prior beliefs into Gaussian processes, but the basic maths is the same. Yeah. Um, the second question is about the fidelity level. Is it always high and low or how do you decide actually this fidelity? Level? Okay, yeah, so that's a really good question. So you can have any number of fidelity levels, um, but there are some very strict sampling rules about how to, to order them, basically. The highest um, fidelity level needs to be basically the, the one that you consider to be the true underlying function that you're trying to generate. And then the fidelities need to uh, be nested into one another. So in terms of the number of data points, the high fidelities need to be smaller, so like a pyramid, and the, the sorry, the domain of, for the feature of space needs to be bigger for the low fidelity function, sorry, the low fidelity um, data set and, and uh, more constrained for the high fidelity one. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's, that's a good for, for an answer. Yeah, sure. 
Mm, um, the other question I have here, which is also a um, uh, quick again question, is about the, um, the choice for the mean function in the GPs you are using, the Gaussian processes. Yes. If you have any tips actually for the choice. Right. Tool, so work, this, this, is the mean, still, yeah. this is still an active area of research, it, how to design kernel functions and how to use the mean effectively. I think the general advice is um, you, you look at the mean of the data, and if you don't see any trends, then you don't specify the, a mean function. But if you do see a trend, like a linear one, uh, it might be good to incorporate that linear trend into the function that way. Um, interestingly, if you had issues with the model converging because you have, I don't know, um, a non-Hermitian uh, uh, covariance matrix, it could actually be interesting to use maybe like a periodic function for the mean, but that's just an idea. I, I, yeah. um, I'm not sure this is like um, yeah, what that's, that's advice, nice. but yeah, that's something a, interesting that's to a, try. A great answer. Um, and uh, and yeah, I agree. It's an active field of research. Uh, I too have these questions whenever I use uh, GPs. Yes, I actually, um, very relevantly, I've just uh, submitted a workshop paper, ICML, that talks about how to set up GPs and choose um, co covariance functions. So I'm very happy to share that. Um, after yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, I have two questions which are similar, very interesting questions actually. So I will just mix them in one, one question. So can your methodology be adapted to other mountains such as the American Andes, I don't know if I pronounce it well, or the Atlas Mountains in Morocco? Yes, yes. This can be applied to different data sets, different variables. Um, as long as you have, I guess like this problem of, uh, having a very small amount of hypothetical data and then um, a large amount of less accurate model simulations, this could work for, for a, a large range of, of cases. I would say that the only caveat is, as I mentioned before, uh, you can't really go crazy with the number of data points that you have, uh, but hopefully the future, with future research, I'll be able to extend the scalability of the model. Mm -hmm. so, so just to give um, an order of magnitude, you don't want more than, 10,000 data points when you're working with Gaussian processes. After that, it starts becoming, at least for exact Gaussian processes, it starts becoming a bit prohibitive. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I have a, a quick question. This one is more um, practical. What code library are you using for GPs? And do you need to run them on GPUs? Or... Um, yes, yeah, so I do run them on GPUs. Uh, depending on, um, the work that I'm doing, I use different uh, Gaussian process libraries. This particular work was done with um, MUKit, but um, I personally also use GPyTorch and GPflow. Great. Uh, so now I will move to the more focused uh, questions. So, um, for example, there's a question about the uncertainties you showed on the power spectrum densities. So how do you get them? Um, yeah, so basically... The, the last maybe... Uh, yeah. yeah. Do they like... Mm -hmm. I do. Can you see this? Yes, yes, this slide. So I ran all this power density spectrum for uh, all the different time steps I have in the model, so for the 10 years. And these are basically the standard deviation spread of the, the, yeah, the different power density spectrums. And just so you know, um, well, two things I didn't specify is that I normalize the values before I really compare them to one another, because basically we're, we're looking at the integral over the whole of the energy, so they need to be normalized. And also to get, um, these um, final like higher resolution values that actually don't exist with, is with the raw Aphrodite and raw Erify, I did a linear interpolation, um, which I think is probably like 
the closest thing to, or like the most basic thing that you can do to mm -hmm. uh, upscale, upscale, downscale the data. I'm not really sure it's downscaling, it's just interpolation. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks. And uh, the next question is, um, uh, do, is deep Gaussian processes, can deep Gaussian processes be used in your work? Are you planning to use them? Yeah, so I, I have used the deep Gaussian processes. And as I mentioned before, uh, they were overfitting mm. because of this, this issue of if you fit the model once on the low fidelity data and you fit it again on the high fidelity data rather than jointly, um, it's going to overfit. You're basically, you're not using a Bayesian optimization anymore. You're doing something that's kind of like in between. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, I think maybe if I use the more complicated version where you're basically conditioning on all the previous uh, layers of data, then sure, why not? I, I think deep Gaussian processes definitely have their place, but um, you can get really interesting results and do really interesting science with um, maybe more simple models. Um, it, it's really Occam's razor. You, you, you don't need to make the model overly complex if what you're trying to model is, is more simple than that. Mm -hmm. And definitely for environmental problems, it, you can spend months working on a model, making it really interesting and having like all these interesting features in it only to find out that a random forest is going to produce better results. <laughs> um, that's that's happened to me a few times. Yeah, I know. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm actually receiving a lot of questions at the same time, but uh, for the sake for the sake of time, we I we, we need to move to the breakout session. So I'll take a very last one because it's very general and interesting for probably the people who are. Um, who are getting into the field. So um, the question is the following. Gaussian processes are not very popular in ML introductory courses. Do you know why? <laughs> and do you have a recommendation for anyone who wants uh, to study them? Um, yes. I think it's just the math is more complicated, probably. Um, it's hard to get into the Bayesian mindset of thinking in probabilities and updating probabilities and calculating marginal likelihoods and divergences. I think it, it definitely took me a while to really feel comfortable with what a Gaussian process is and have a very intuitive understanding of it and how it would work. Uh, so that just comes from my like, playing around with it. Uh, in terms of resources, I would say uh, probably Carl Rasmussen's book, uh, Gaussian Processes for Machine Learning is really going to be the, the place to start. There are lots of people who uh, write blog posts based on the book, so you could maybe read those first and then come back and look at the maps, but uh, everything really comes from Carl's book anyway, so in, mm -hmm. including all the notation. So I would say that's that's the reference. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Kenza. So, um, so yeah, now I leave the floor to Iman. Uh, and of course, for the other questions, Sorry again for, for time, but you can use and uh, profit for benefit from the uh, breakout session to ask them to Kenza. Yeah. Thank you, Erdogan. Thank you, Kenza, for all those clarifications. And as Erdogan said, you can ask your questions in the breakout room. So we will move to the breakout rooms right away. But I will just stop the, the YouTube stream and then we can move to the breakout sessions. <laughs>